And now we worship God through the word. I'd like for you to follow along with me in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, the first 11 verses. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Let us pray. Oh God, open your word to our hearts now and open our hearts to your word. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. I love these pictures that Sandy has put underneath the title of today's message, which is cross-eyed. That's not exactly what I mean by cross-eyed, but I love the chuckle. That's so good. I have a friend who is a Catholic priest down in Virginia, and he says that they have a big cross. It's actually a crucifix that hangs from the ceiling by wires it hangs over the altar, and uh, it, it's a large cross, a large crucifix. It's the focal point in their sanctuary. The cross is actually made of wood and brass, and the image of Jesus' body on the, that's fashioned to the cross is made of bronze. He says that when you walk into their sanctuary and you look up, it looks like the body of Jesus is attached to the church. But he says, if you keep walking, if you view it from the side, there is a space about like this right here, a space between the cross and the sculpture of Jesus' body. He had a visitor to come one day who told him, I don't like your cross. The priest said, why? And he says, well, just look at it. Um, from one angle, it looks like Jesus is dying on the cross. But from another angle, I see that there's a space in between the cross and Jesus' body. 
I mean, is he on the cross? Is he off the cross? Off the cross? Is he dying? Or is he rising? The priest said, well, maybe it's both. It all depends on how you look at it. You know, in John's gospel, Jesus is speaking to his disciples the night before he died. And within some 18 hours or so, he will be dying on the cross. As we read the crucifixion in John's gospel, we could ask this question. What is happening to Jesus as he hangs on the cross? Is he dying? Is he rising? I believe from John's perspective, it's both. You see, in John's gospel, crucifixion is the most tragic death in history. And it's the moment when the glory of God revealed in Jesus shines forth for all to see. It all depends on how you look at it. On one hand, what happens to Jesus from Holy Thursday to Good Friday afternoon is the worst possible thing. Christ had proclaimed the glorious freedom of the children of God, and then a crowd of thugs tracked him down in the Garden of Gethsemane, tied him up, and eventually put him in jail. Jesus had shown us so much love, but humanity responded with so much hate. He used his hands to heal, but we nailed those hands to the tree. He revealed the heart of God to all humanity but we thrust a spear into his side. Jesus said he had received glory from the Father and had shown that glory to us. On the cross, he dies an inglorious death, a convicted criminal between other criminals. Jesus had proclaimed that he was the bread of life. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All this talk about life. And on Good Friday, there was nothing but the stench of death. His birth was accompanied by an angelic song, glory to God in the highest. And now Jesus dies on the cross because of our sins. There he was dying because death has to be conquered. What was he doing up there on the cross? He was dying, and he was rising. In John's gospel, the passion of Jesus, I mean, the whole story of his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion, the passion of Jesus is portrayed in such a way that you come away with the understanding that this is Jesus's finest hour. Did you hear the language of John 17 as we read it a moment ago? At the Last Supper, Judas finally ran out to betray him, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples and shared a meal of bread and wine that he asked us to share in memory of him, which we're going to do after this message. And then with betrayal and impending death hanging over the scene, Jesus begins to speak about glory. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son can glorify you. Now, wait a minute. What? The brutal cru crucifixion will take place in just a few hours, and Jesus is talking about his hour of glory? Jesus said to the Father, I did the work that you sent me to do. I had glory in your presence before the world began. I've made your name known. Everything I've given to people, I received from you. Now I'm glorified in them. Death is on the horizon, and yet all this talk of glory. Well, in John's gospel, this is the hour. This is Jesus' finest hour. The hour when God's glory is revealed in his Son. As John tells it, he portrays a Jesus who is dignified and directing the action, making sure that everything goes as it should. In John's gospel, especially the passion, well, when they come to arrest him in the garden, in John's gospel, he calmly directs every moment of that interaction. When falsely accused, Jesus doesn't argue. He just stands in truthful silence. In John's gospel, Jesus carries the cross by himself. He doesn't need assistance. In John's gospel, he entrusts the care of his mother to the disciple, John. You see, in his deepest hour of suffering, he, he's caring for his loved ones. And when all is properly concluded in John's gospel, he doesn't scream out with fear or pain. He calmly announces, it is finished, and then hands his spirit over to his father. This is not a depiction of a frightened victim being hunted down by death. No, it's a depiction of the Son of God who knows this suffering is not as strong as God's love for him. He knows the glory of God's love is revealed when we see God is willing to suffer with us, for us. He knows death will not get the last word in the story of his life. He faces a death that is real, and yet he does so in John with courage because he knows that eternal life is more real than the death that he's about to experience. On the cross, in John, Jesus is dying and rising. It all depends on how you look at it. And you know something? In this time, in our day of pandemic, in this passage, we encounter a truth that is crucial for our life and the life of the world. Now, why do I say that? 
I say that because right now, right now, the cross is still happening to people. It's happening in hospital rooms where people are struggling to breathe. It's happening in places around the world where quarantines force us to experience isolation. The cross is still happening to people wherever uncertainty leads to fear, where economic hardship leads to anxiety, where loneliness leads to suffering. Yeah, the crucifixion is still happening. It's still happening where poverty saps the spirit, where racism breeds hate, and where immorality gets rewarded. In so many situations, we are dying. Death is real. Suffering is staggering. When people are on these crosses, they are experiencing dying. But if you approach their crosses from a different angle, from that of that's revealed in John's gospel, we begin to realize that in our moments of greatest loss, the rising of God is at work. The glory of God is present and can be seen. The glorious rising of God can be seen when frightening circumstances lead people to a greater commitment to love each other. The glorious rising of God can be seen when lonely moments lead us to reach out to others who may be in need. The glorious rising of God can be seen when an atmosphere of despair leads you to create a reason for others to hope. The glorious rising of God can be seen when an unprecedented health crisis leads us to re-examine our lives our priorities, our relationships, to strengthen our commitment to the living God. And when you and I feel like we are experiencing the cross, the risen Jesus enables us to choose, to choose to be people who rise, even as we feel part of us is dying. This is the seventh Sunday in the Easter season. You know what? In the Easter season of the year 2020, we must look at everything through the lens of the cross and unite everything that's happening to us to what happened to Jesus. He will teach us how to look at our lives. He will teach us seriously, seriously, to be cross-eyed. Cross-eyed people people who view every moment through the prism of the cross, cross-eyed people who see that even our darkest hour might be our most glorious hour. So, dear people of God, are you dying?
or are you rising? I think it's both. It all depends on how you look at it. Amen.